Hello, everybody. Welcome to all Grade 11 learners and Grade 11 educators. My name is Linda Hackner. I'm the Director of Education at the Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide Center. And, to with, and together with my colleagues at the center, we welcome you to Unit 2 in the section of your curriculum that deals with theories of race, um, pseudoscience in the, eight, in the 19th and 20th century. Um, in our last unit, we did a basic introduction. Today, we're going to focus on the pseudoscience of race and on social Darwinism. So let's start with pseudoscientific race theory, how it begins, where it begins, and when it begins. And before I do that, I just want to remind you, pseudoscience means false science or incorrect science or non-factual science. So we start with Carolus Linnaeus, who was a very, very important person, both actually today in your life and in mine. Why? Because he was a botanist and naturalist who devised the natural system, which became the basis for the classification of all species. So when you think about um, the cat species, you know that belonging to the cat species are lions, tigers, leopards, cheetahs, and also your little kitty cat at home. Belonging to the dog species are wolves, hyenas, and your dog at home. You would know if I said to you, tell me what these different fruits belong to, and I said orange, nachi, grapefruit, lemon, you would know that they are all belonging to the citrus group. So that's what he did. Really, really important. But he did something else. He also divided humanity into four groups. So he said there are four different races of man. He said there's the Americanus. Those, he said, were people who lived in North America, the native North Americans, and he said their skin tone had a reddish tint. The Asiaticus, people who live in Asia, their skin tone had a yellowish tint. Africanus, people from Africa, their skin tone had a black or a brown tint. And Europaeus, their skin tone had a pink or a white tint. And so he divided humanity into these four sections and looked at them almost as though they were different species. Moving along a little bit, we now come to Dr. Samuel Morton. He lives from 1799 to 1851, so we're already in the 1800s, the 19th century. And what is he saying? He says, well, you can prove that different kinds of people have different sizes of brain and therefore some are better than others. And what does he do? He takes skulls and he fills them with mustard seeds. And then he measures the weight of the mustard seed to prove that some skulls hold more mustard seeds than other skulls. And of course, the skull that holds more mustard seeds belongs to a European, a person who would have white skin, a person from Europe, Britain. And so you see how this notion of race and of racism starts to take root. So we want to look at what the, the real basis of race theory is grade 11s, and it's based on blood. What they say is this, your blood and the purity of your blood tells you how pure your race is. Now, before I go any further to explain how this plays out, I need to just reiterate, repeat that blood is blood. We all have red blood. We may have different blood groups, yes, but if you need blood, if you're in hospital, God forbid, and you need blood, the doctor's not going to ask for blood that comes from someone who looks like you or is of the same culture as you or the same religion as you or the same age as you. It's going to ask for blood group A or B positive or whatever your blood group is because all blood is red, all blood is human, and we all have the same blood inside us. No blood is more pure than any other blood. 
So that you need to understand. But unfortunately, this was the belief in those days. And so they said, you can tell how pure a person is, how pure they are racially by their blood. And how are you going to tell this? I can't see your blood. I can see your skin. So the lighter your skin, the purer your blood, the more racially pure you are. And I'll tell you what that means. The darker your skin, the less pure your blood, the less racially pure you are. And what does this mean? Well, this means that they believed that in your blood is contained who you are. So if your father is poor, it's in the blood, you are going to be poor. If your father is very, very clever, it's in your blood. You're going to be very, very clever. This was the belief. So let's see how it plays out. I'd like to introduce you now to Charles Darwin because he was a very, very important man and taught us a lot of important things. Charles Darwin, again, look at the dates, guys. Look at the dates, context, context. We're in the 19th century. Things are starting to happen. Science is starting to speed up. Okay. So Charles Darwin is a naturalist. He goes to a place called the Galapagos Islands to study animals. And what he discovers is that some animals have adapted themselves in order to survive. And he came up with the notion that those animals that would survive would be those that are most able to adapt. And he called the survival of the fittest. He does not mean fit, gym fit. He means able to adapt. So let's have a look at these two chaps. Okay, we've got two tortoises on the screen. The one tortoise is on my left. I'm not sure on your screen what it's on, but he looks like the kind of tortoise you and I know. He's got his domed shell. He's eating the grass. He's an ordinary tortoise, that a common tortoise that you would know. The other tortoise, you'll notice his shell looks like really a sort of a bridge, a dome, an arc, a bow. And that's strange, isn't it? So this tortoise's shell has adapted. Why? Because the islands are small. If all the tortoises are going to eat the grass, there will soon be no more grass, no more grass, no more food, no more tortoises. So the tortoises adapt. And how do they adapt? That the shell adapts so that certain tortoises can reach leaves up in trees and eat things that are higher up. So this is adaptation of parts of the tortoise's body so that it can survive. Grade 11s. No tortoise is better than another tortoise. No tortoise is more tortoisey than another tortoise. They have just adapted. One is not better than the other. One is simply adapted differently than the other. And that is called survival of the fittest, the ability to adapt. Now, along comes Herbert Spencer, 1820 to 1903. We're already in the 1900s, okay? So Herbert Spencer, who's a philosopher and a sociologist, says, no, you can apply this to human society. And what does he mean by this? Well, Herbert Spencer says, human society is permanently in an evolutionary process. And we can all agree with that. I don't argue with that. We are permanently in an evolutionary process. Society is, not human beings, okay? So he says, however, this process is that in which the fittest are chosen to dominate. Okay, so what does he mean by the fittest? Well, of course, he means those most able, those most um, advantaged. And who are they chosen to dominate? Well, they're chosen to dominate the unfit. And who chooses them to do this? Well, God does. Yeah. So there are armies of unfit in society, says this man. There are the poor who simply can't compete. 
Why? Because they're poor, which means they end up being uneducated. Where did they come from? So let's think about England in the 1900s. You've got the Industrial Revolution. You've got people coming from the country into the city. They're pouring in, and so the cities become very, very, very overpopulated. People can't find jobs. People um, are living in terrible conditions, which leads them to be sick. People are starving. People are ill. So those on top, those who consider themselves to be the fittest, look at these people and say, well, it's in their blood. If they're poor, it's because their father is poor. If they drink, it's because their father was drinking. If they cannot survive, it's because they are unfit because it's in their blood. And so, says um, the social Darwinist, just as nature weeds out the unfit in nature, those who can't survive die. An enlightened society ought to weed out its unfit and permit them to die off so as not to weaken the racial stock. What is an enlightened society? A society that understands things, a society that has a view of the world, a, so a society that is advanced. This is what um, is said, that they must be permitted to die off so as not to weaken the racial stock. I want you to remember that word because in our next unit, we're gonna talk about eugenic, eugenics and this word, will come up. So let's just recap social Darwinism. Survival of the fittest, remember, those who have the most advantage, the most able, is social Darwinism. In Darwinism, survival of the fittest means those most able to adapt to their surrounding to survive. The right to dominate, because if you're the most able, then you can dominate those who are not, those who are unfit to be part of the population. So that's social Darwinism. Now there are consequences of this and let's have a look at those consequences. Social Darwinism, survival of the fittest in society and race theory, those who have good blood, those who have bad blood, leads to what? It leads to racism. The notion of the superior, well I have superior blood, why? Because I am light. I am better. Inferior. Also, sorry, I just want to say grade 11s, it was not only those with white skins who were considered superior. It was those who were white skinned, but also in a position of superiority, perhaps in society, because white people in England were poor and diseased and sick. So it's about blood. So you have superior blood and inferior blood, which leads to racism and prejudice. It leads to institutional racism. So there's a difference between individual and institutional racism. Individual racism is between people. Institutional racism is government, is law. And it leads to oppression. Well, we know about all of that from South Africa. But let's see what the consequences are worldwide and particularly for Africa. Guys, what's the context of all of this? Well, we have the scramble for Africa going on. We have European countries all wanting bits of Africa. Why? Because Africa has the means to give people an economic boost. Africa has the means to give people domination in other ways. And so these ideas, social Darwinism, racial theory, and eugenics, but I'll talk about that separately, justify colonialism. They justify cultural domination. My culture is better than yours. I'm more able. I'm fitter than you are. Oppression of all manner of oppression. You may not speak your language. You will speak mine. Slavery and of course, child labor. Grade 11 learners and teachers, thank you very much for watching this unit. Um, I hope to see you again in unit three when we talk about eugenics and then look at different case studies. So thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.